in, in Geneva, uh, a southern NGO. And uh, I'm very happy to see you here right now. Uh, I'm, as you can see, and I am sure some of you must have heard also, we are struggling a bit uh, at my age to come to terms with this technology. So I'm trying to get used to my own voice. Uh, and also it feels like as if I am a character in an old sci-fi movie, not the new ones. Uh, and it seemed like also as if I'm on a movie set and I can assure you this is my first experience. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm sure that my speakers uh, are much more used to uh, this technology and this setting. Uh, but I will also, I think by the end of this, will get used to it. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, let me, uh, before uh, very briefly introducing the panelists and uh, starting our discussion this morning, very briefly let me give you the context for this session. Uh, three points in that regard. One, we believe that holistic, synergetic approaches and views are needed. Uh, trade people work in their circles like I often do, and climate change people in another circle, agriculture, food security, agro-processing, private sector. So it's, it's like all of them have their circles which do not often overlap where the world and its challenges are not so neatly defined and in watertight compartments. We have been doing our bit to take a holistic look at issues, and this is the larger context of this session, the, the importance of nexus approaches. Second point, uh, in that context, agriculture, fisheries, agro-processing present a very interesting example where the confluence of the various streams can be seen and should be examined. Uh, for example, of course, as you all know, in these negotiations in the WTO MC, agriculture is at the center uh, through various means, which is not new. Uh, but those of us like me who have been following the UNFCCC as well, would recall that last month in Bonn at the COP23, for the first time that body adopted a very landmark decision on agriculture. So now there is going to be an agriculture sort of work program under that organization as well, which has come about after the efforts of many, including many developing countries from Africa as well, uh, to get to that point. And then, of course, uh, uh, fisheries brings in, uh, as, as well as agriculture, the link with SDGs as well. And when it comes to agro-processing, the role of private sectors, small uh, and medium enterprises, uh, value chains come in. So agriculture in its various manifestations is an interesting, potential, promising area to look at the nexus approaches. Third point, our speakers today are bringing in their perspectives from their personal experiences, from their organizational perspective, from the area of expertise they have had. And uh, so, for example, Marion Jensen is uh, a, a chief economist at International Trade Center. So they have done a lot of work on value chains and private sector and agro-processing and e-commerce and you name it. So, so that's, that's where probably she will be talking about. We have Jane Nalunga, uh, country director of Siatini in Uganda, a very well-known NGO, uh, and she has been active in almost all these fora, as well as a lot of work on the ground, which is always very important to look at. Uh, then we have Elia, a consular of Tanzania, uh, to the WTO and UN in Geneva, uh, a seasoned diplomat in trade negotiations, uh, very much involved uh, there, as well as uh, part of efforts at the regional and, and national level. And finally, uh, last but certainly and never the least, my very good old friend David Vivas, who has been wearing many hats, starting his career as a Venezuelan diplomat, then working for NGOs in Geneva, environmental NGOs, trade NGOs, and then moving on to UNCTAD, and uh, his interest and expertise covers many areas, including fisheries subsidies. So what they are going to do, we never prescribe to our speakers of what to say and what not to say. So they will be bringing in their perspectives. Uh, with examples and sectors that they are more comfortable with. So you would detect some commonalities, but also a lot of diversity of views. I would imagine that, that to be the case. And then it would be for us to find the common things. So it's not, a session is not designed to be prescriptive in nature. It's more to share uh, and then have discussion. Uh, finally, before I start with our first speaker, uh, there are uh, one speaker we are missing, uh, which is uh, Shishir Piradarshi, Director of Development Division of the WTO. Uh, 
Uh, as you know, the WTO negotiations are still going on and development is still being negotiated. So given his primary role there, he has sent his apologies, which we fully understand and wish him well and hope that there could be an outcome on development as well. So thank you very much again. So uh, as we were discussing before starting this session among the speakers, uh, we always want to start with women and the men will follow. So Jane, uh, uh, sorry, uh, because you wanted men to, to lead, okay. So uh, Elia, so uh, can I request you to, to make your presentation? Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Rashid, and uh, good morning, uh, all, of, all of you. Uh, as I pointed out that uh, I'm coming from um, Geneva, um, as a negotiator, so I'm bringing to you some uh, aspects of the multilateral uh, contribution to whatever <clears throat> is needed in the making our world sustainable. Um, like like um, the subject itself, so ensuring sustainability through Nexus approach that climate change, trade and food security. Um, let me begin by appreciating the invitation that I have been given to come and speak um, on this uh, uh, subject. Uh, we all have to be concerned on the increasing population um, which is estimated by uh, 2050 to reach 9.7. Uh, this population definitely will need to be fed but also this population is going to bring a lot of destruction on Earth as well. So uh, we need to begin uh, to see and uh, to innovate the way we are doing things to make sure that uh, the world remains safe for everyone. Um, we will need actually what I have referred here as a smart decisions in every aspect we are we are dealing with. Smart, in, smart decision, uh, smart approach in the way we do production, the way we do distribution, storage, and conservation. Um, that calls, um, that uh, calls from what I'm coming as a trade negotiator, we need also to have smart trading rules, uh, which actually acknowledges and uh, uh, the, the need of technology transfer, uh, information sharing, and uh, it calls our future to focus, uh, that our government, they focus also to, uh, to formulate policies which they are going to make trade, in environment, and agriculture in a very synchronized way, but in a, um, uh, but making it um, a, a more efficient, um, the way, as I've said, in the way we do production and uh, the way we distribute our goods we have produced. The, at, at the present, if you look from the developing world, for example, they produce a lot, but a lot also it's being wasted because of lack of technology, value addition, also lack of, of technology on how the, 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 the storage systems. Um, for me, I would call that we need a, a shared responsibility. Uh, a shared responsibility uh, because we, sh we share the common sphere. If you think these problems are only for the developing countries and that the ones who are supposed to address their own problem, I think we would be wrong. And if we think that uh, these smart uh, tools, smart uh, uh, advancement, I mean the advanced uh, technology, is only for developed countries and for us we would have to take it slowly, also we are making a mistake because we are sharing the global, the global sphere uh, together. We have managed actually to have some barriers, to have some borders in the terms of the, the surface, the earth surface. But on the sphere, we have 
and we will not have barriers to, to, to protect. So um, if, there, if uh, there are calamities uh, happening or occurring simply because of the distractions, definitely we are going to share it because their calamities, they don't have borders. They will cross from one region from one to another region, from one country to another country. So I think on that perspective, we all understand that we need to act together. We need to act together uh, in terms of making sure that uh, um, all the approaches we are taking, they are sustainable and they are environmental friendly. Uh, for, for that matter, I would actually uh, appreciate and commend the efforts the CATS has been, uh, have started taking, um, especially in my region uh, where they have, uh, we have this project of uh, packed EAC2, which also is, leaky, uh, is looking the linkages between the climate change, trade, and food security, and particularly the agro-processing. Um, from the WTO perspective, we as negotiators in the WTO, we could contribute in a number of, um, uh, a number of coming up with a number of rules. As I said, they need to be uh, smart rules in various areas. We, as you would uh, be aware of what is going on here in uh, Buenos Aires, the issues we are negotiating, they are all relevant uh, to contribute to the sustainable environment, sustainable um, uh, growth, sustainable food production. Um, for example, the fisheries, of course, we are saying, please, if you are putting a lot of subsidies in fishery, causing a lot of capacity to the fishermen, and uh, they, therefore causing destruction in terms of what they are fishing, please, can you, can we have a standard way of, um, of doing that across all the, the nations? So we can have rules that uh, set the standard where, or the levels of where uh, we can say this is the limit, of the subsidies we are putting to the, the fishermen so that we cannot just overfish and uh, even sometimes we fish too much than what we can consume. Um, come to the f uh, public stock holding, definitely, of course, as we are talking about uh, food security, uh, it's uh, one of the important areas that we are negotiating and everybody as a matlato uh, members we have also to contribute to that. that uh, um, what is happening um, uh, people are suffering for hunger, they have also to, uh, to, 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 to also get uh, food. Um, also, in terms of the trade and environment, as we have a, a, a committee in trade and environment, we could also contribute uh, in making sure that uh, decisions being made in that particular committee also contribute to, uh, to, to what I have referred, smart, rules. For example, if you talk about trade and, uh, trade and environment, we could <clears throat> agree on, uh, of course, the process is already, and uh, we are negotiating on uh, environmental goods, but also these environmental goods, they can uh, contribute to what I have already mentioned, that uh, um, uh, we need technology transfer, we need products that, which are, go, are going to be smart in terms of efficient production and uh, uh, efficient storage and uh, whatever you wish to call. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, like I say, the population is growing. And uh, for this population is growing, we will really need to feed them. But also this population is coming um, is coming also to cause destruction on this uh, environment. And therefore, we need to make a smart decision right now in a number of multilateral setups, but also bilaterally, uh, individual countries, regionally. So that uh, across all the, uh, the, the growth of the population, uh, we can be able to feed them because we have smart, uh, smart, and, uh, smart uh, uh, ways and uh, um, means of producing, but also storing even the little food we are producing to feed them. Uh, so I would say we all have something to contribute to this process of making the world smarter and making the world to be a better place for everybody. I think I will stop there. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Elia, for setting the stage, actually, for, for, the, for the rest of the speakers and, and the session. Uh, uh, and uh, you, you made uh, many 
uh, good important points. Let me just uh, <coughs> refer to two or three of them. I quite like the way you phrase the need for having smart trade rules, which uh, combine trade, agriculture, and environment. And that's where the role of technology, and in that context, a shared responsibility it is very important. You also mentioned that in the WTO, all rules can be and are uh, viewed in that context, particularly fisheries and public stockholding and the work in CTE. Maybe we can come to that later in the discussion with, with more specific examples and ideas. Now let me turn to Jane uh, uh, for her presentation. So Jane, you have the floor. Um, thank you so much, Rashid, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation is going to be based on what we are doing, the project we are undertaking uh, with CATS. My organization is Siatini. We work within Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, and we, we have a, a, a project called PACT, Promoting Agriculture, uh, Climate Change, and Trade Linkages. Um, <coughs> this project, it's a... Uh, it has been ongoing for some time, and it will be ending in 20, uh, 2019. Um, <clears throat> let me give you a background uh, to this project. As you are all aware, the issue of food security is very, very critical at this material time. Uh, the population globally is exploding. Uh, by 2050, we are going to be 9.5 billion people. And most of those people are going to be in Africa, because in Africa, our population growth rate is very, very high. Uh, so the issue of agriculture is very important. The issue of food security is very important. But it's also very important in Africa, and also in my region, East Africa, uh, because agriculture is, one, is our source of livelihood, source of export, so it's our livelihood. Yet agriculture in my region is also subsistence. It's um, rain-fed. Therefore, it's also susceptible to climate change. You know? And we have had so many instances of uh, famine because of droughts, because of floods. So the issue of climate change uh, <coughs> Is very, very deep, uh, is a, is a, is a reality in my region. <clears throat> in this project, we are looking at the issue of industrialization, the issue of agro processing. Industrialization is back on the agenda in Africa after a very long time, and there is um, uh, 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 an understanding that if we are to provide jobs. We are to increase agricultural production and also to promote backward and forward linkages between agriculture, industry, and trade. We need to industrialize. So industrialization is back on the agenda. And for us in Africa and also in East Africa, the issue of agro processing is very, very critical because through agro processing, we hope that it will stimulate agricultural production and productivity. Because agro-processing provides a market for, for, for farmers' pro production. Um, therefore, the nexus then between trade, climate change, agriculture, and food security is very, very critical. For example, trade provides inputs, access to inputs, technology for agriculture. But it also provides markets, viable markets. That's in an ideal situation. And that's why we want trade policies that can be able to do that. Provide viable markets for the producers, but also protect um, their production. And that's why in these negotiations, we are talking about a special safeguard mechanism. We are talking about issues of uh, public stockholding for food security so that government can be able to buy from the producers and also distribute. Um, so the link between those three issues is very, very critical. Because for us in Africa, climate change is a reality. 
we can't run away from it. So all policies have to be designed in such a way uh, that climate change is addressed. And also in our project, we also look at mainstreaming gender in all these issues. Today we are talking about women and trade. The declaration was uh, passed and Uganda, we, we supported the declaration because when we talk about agriculture, women at the center of agriculture. So in our, in our project, again, we look at mainstreaming that. So <clears throat> the issue of international trade policies and issues of climate, uh, climate policies are crucial to ensure that these linkages promote uh, food security. So this is the background to our project. The project looks at a holistic approach to designing these policies <coughs> and also to the implementation of this, these policies. Uh, this is new in, 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 in our region because each policy has been moving on its own. Trade, climate change, you no, know, they haven't been meeting. And these are some of the key, very key features of this project, that it brings together the actors in trade, in climate change, and in food security. You know? uh, no, and at all levels, at the global level. Because at the global level, we have the WTO, but we also have the UNFCCC negotiations. In most countries, the two don't meet. When these ones go to New York, these ones are in Geneva, you know? But in this project, it has tried to bring together the negotiators, the UNFCC negotiators and the WTO negotiators too, so that the, the policies don't contradict each other. Uh, it has also brought, again, at national and regional level, the same actors of people working on trade, agriculture, and climate change the na at national and regional level. In fact, you find our meetings, we have the Minister of Trade, the Mi Minister of Water and Development, and Minister of Agriculture. You know, so they are key, key actors. Then at local level, we also bring all the actors, we bring the agro-processors, especially the women, the small-scale Agro processors, people making uh, chili sauce and you know making tea and all that. So that's a, a very unique key feature of this project. Another unique key feature of this project is the fact that the negotiators hear from the actors, you no, know? uh, <clears throat> and this is done through. We 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 cut out. Um, <clears throat> research, but it's uh, action-based research. You know, on any issue affecting the agro-processors, we talk to the stakeholders. What do you say about this issue? You know, so we come up with country update notes, you know, of the voices of the people that on this issue, this is the reality on the ground. And those country update notes are taken to the negotiators. This is what the people are saying. This is what the agro-processors are saying. So that the, policy, the negotiators can be able to turn those into, into negotiating positions. So the voices of the people have been heard in these negotiations in a way. Because you look at our negotiators like Elia here, we have been sending people's voices. You're, so in a way, um, the people's voices have been, have been heard. Another key area, we, key feature of this, um, uh, this project is the, the intervention in policy review. Um, at the moment, like I said, industrialization is back on the agenda. For example, in Uganda, our industrial policy was made in 2008, 2008. Until now, that's what we have been using. They, there's nothing, to, they don't talk about climate change, no? Food security is not there, gender is not there, you know? So we are 
the process that review is on. And this project has played a very, very great key role in bringing these issues on the table in the policy, in this policy review. And again, also in Rwanda, they're also reviewing their policy. So the project has also helped uh, to bring these interlinkages um, on the table. Uh, there is also the issue of training. The interlinkages, the nexus is not clear. You know, so we, 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 under the project, we do a lot of training to bring out to the nexus. When we talk about the nexus, climate change, trade, food security, agriculture, what does it mean in reality? And how do you transplant that into policy, into policy action? So issues of training are also on the table, but also, and also to appreciate especially for policymakers you know, and negotiators to appreciate that linkage, that the linkage is there, it's a reality, and we need policies uh, which recognize that reality. And maybe lastly, hmm? yeah, uh, lastly is the issue of um, a regional approach. Uh, this project um, is implemented within the region of East Africa. We already have... As a region, we have a common market protocol. We are, so we are moving together as a region. And this project has also helped us further to move as a region, to put our position together as a region, because also for the WTO and the UNFCC negotiators in Geneva, they meet as a region. Uh, and at, at the national and regional level, we also try to bring that actors within the region so that we can have a common approach as a region. Maybe, maybe I stop there. But um, what maybe as a way forward, it, has, it isn't easy mm, to bring those uh, approaches and also to translate them into policy, into policy positions and also to implement them. But, but we, 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 we have to continue, you know. Because if we are to really to ensure sustainability, those approaches have to be, uh, to be undertaken. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you uh, for uh, particularly describing the methodology being used with various examples. Because yes, as you towards the end said, it is not easy. All of us are so used to working in silos and have our respective areas of expertise and mandates and, and responsibilities. So bringing these together is not easy. And then the approach and methodology that you described at the center of that seems to be bringing stakeholders together, whether they be negotiators or policy makers or people from the ground. Uh, so it would be, I, I, I hope that there will be time during the discussion. People may want to know more about that. Also, if I could link uh, uh, part of what you were saying to what Elia said earlier, this industrialization, agro-processing, food security issues in the region and their possible link with the smart trade rules mm -hmm. that uh, Elia was talking about earlier. Maybe we can come to that point later. Now I'm moving towards my right. Uh, it, was a sh it was a total coincidence that I started from the left. Uh, my, my own uh, ideology is very clear. It is on the left, but uh, this was, I can assure you. Uh, uh, but I can also assure you, I can also, also assure you that knowing all of them and my wonderful colleagues, uh, if we had gone by their ideological inclinations, they would all would be sitting on the left. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so Marion, uh, now I give the floor to you. Thank you. Um, allow me to, uh, to start, uh, maybe to say something about the organization I work for. Um, I'm the chief economist at the International Trade Center. We are an international organization based in Geneva. And uh, we are a sister, or maybe I should say daughter organization of the UNCTAD and, uh, and the WTO. Um, we are very active in the trade area, but not in the rule setting. We are, as I like to say, the ones that are supposed to make trade happen. Uh, once the rules are set for uh, trade to be possible, we work with the private sector and for the private sector in order to help them to take advantage of this. Um, 
Traditionally, our work has been a lot in uh, the agricultural sector because our main client countries are developing countries and even often, um, rather often, LDCs within developing countries. And as has been said before, the agricultural sector is crucial in these countries. Um, um, I would like to explain how we work in this area um, by maybe explaining our own value chain of how we work on agriculture and the type of offering have, we have. Um, we have a very strong offering on providing information that is relevant also for the theme that we discuss here. We offer then based on information strategies for our country counterparts, typically at the country level. And once there's a strategy, we also help to implement that strategy and to make things actually happen. And when we do, do this in the area of agriculture, food, food processing, with a sustainability context, the issue of sustainability standards plays a role in all these three types of deliverables, <coughs> and I will come back to that. So talking about information uh, provision, uh, that's an area where we think um, there that um, international organizations can often play a role because there's a public good aspect to providing information. Information on where is demand for which product, where is the, uh, who has a comparative advantage for this product, what, what is the potential for, to export that comes from there, what are the prices in the market, and very important for this field, what are the standards that are being applied in this market. Um, so we recently, we here actually launched uh, a global trade help desk, as it's been called, together with UNCTAD and, uh, and the World Bank, where we pull together information from different organizations on uh, trade flows, trade potential, tariffs, um, standards, regulations that are relevant uh, for all sectors, but including the agricultural sector. Now, when it comes to standards, we have one database that is particularly interesting for this topic. It's the sustainability uh, map. Um, it's a database where we put together non-governmental standards. So standards being set by, for instance, NGOs, or standards being set by the private sector related to sustainability. So they can be related to um, criteria like labor standards, they can be related to criteria like environmental friendliness or um, criteria related to ethical uh, considerations or including, for instance, localities in production. Now what this database does, and I'm a fan of the database because even I know how to use it, it tells you if I'm, um, for instance, a banana producer in Ecuador and I want to export to Switzerland, where I currently live, what are the kind of standards that are being applied in that market? So if I would like to sell to Migros, one of our biggest retailers, um, I will find there of bananas, there is an uh, environmental friendliness standard, there's a uh, sustainability standard, and these are the criteria you have to meet in order to get that standard. And what is nice about the database is that it also tells you if maybe you also want to sell to Aldi in Germany next door, they also have a banana standard. <coughs> That are the things you have to meet. And what you will often find out, that there is a huge overlap between these standards. So the nice thing with that database is it gives you a lot of transparency and helps you as a producer to understand if I um, am able to sell in Switzerland, what else do I have to do in order to also sell to, um, sell to Germany or to France? And it helps you, therefore, to make a better analysis of what the costs and the benefits would be of applying a certain standard. We work on this sustainability map with, um, with the private sector because it contains a lot of private sector standards. And what is interesting, uh, what I find an interesting dynamic is that the private sector sees the cost advantage of collaborating on these issues. So they realize, ha, huh, if uh, that producer is certified by the retailer in my neighboring country, maybe I should accept that certification and not put another cost on top to certify it for my country. So we get a, a type of collaboration and harmonization 
from the private sector that is often difficult to put in place among governments. Mm. So that's an interesting, uh, is an interesting dynamic we have observed. Now I mentioned information market uh, relevant information standards, uh, trade flows. Another piece uh, of information we work on, but often at a different level, is price information. And here I come to uh, also theme technologies that we mentioned before. So one of the fields in which we work is that we help in the field at the country level producers via their smartphones, because they often have cell, of cell phones now, to understand what is the current price of my product in which city or in which market. And this gives them a, a much stronger negotiation position when it comes to selling their product on. So I think that's one of the ways in which we uh, try to help to bring more value to the bottom of the, of the value chain. So this, uh, so much about information. Um, we, so we help providers, but also government, to have better access to information. We also help governments to develop strategies uh, for their exports, for uh, specific sectors, for specific products, depending on what they are interested in. And here we have a long tradition in working on agricultural strategies. Um, in and where we typically work, go to a rather, um, let's say, disaggregated level and develop specific product strategies. So you, we have recently, for instance, uh, launched a cardamom strategy in Nepal. We are working on a dairy strategy in Afghanistan. Uh, we are working on groundnuts, rice, mangoes in Senegal, cacao, tea, uh, sunflower seeds, and a very long tradition we have on coffee, uh, where we produce one of our flagship publications, the International Coffee Guide, uh, because we have also a big international network in that area. So when we develop these strategies, we work in the country with different stakeholders, and um, we uh, always, add a contain, always develop first a value chain analysis of what is the value chain in this product and where is this particular country positioned, where can it move uh, if it wants to move up the value chain, for instance. Now, what focus we put on that analysis depends very much on the governmental objectives. So, for in the case of Afghanistan, we have a situation where the country wants to sell, uh, produce more for its local publication. So there we are more in the food security uh, context than in the export context. In certain countries, uh, there is a big concern about uh, uh, sustainability, climate sustainability. So we build in that aspects when we look at where you want to move with your value chain. Or it's basically, it's, 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 an, um, it's a concern about being able to meet the higher price, hit the higher price segment in the foreign country, and that's often a price segment where you sell a sustainable product. So uh, the strategy very much takes into account the national objectives. This may be environmental sustainability, a creation of jobs for the young, a creation of jobs for women, and we design then the particular product strategy in line with that objective of the country developed with the stakeholders. Um, we don't stop here. Uh, where, sometimes we stop there, but uh, often then we also move into implementation. Again, it depends on what the country wants. And when we move into implementation, the ideal setup for us is one where our the parts of the institution that work on implementation are already involved in the strategy design, meet the stakeholders, bring stakeholders together, and often bring the buyers together. Now, um, in implementation, we then look at what can needs to be done at the firm level, in the ecosystem, uh, business ecosystem, and at the national level in order to hit that objective that we have developed in the strategy. So when it comes to the national level, yes, we give advice on that's the kind of policies you may want to adjust. So that's where we enter maybe a bit into the national policy level, but it's only one aspect. <coughs> ecosystem, we look at what kind of institutions do you need, what kind of bodies are useful in order for you to meet the targets you have. In this area we discuss standard setting bodies, certifying bodies, uh, cold chains, laboratories are the typical type of institutions we look at in this area. Because the big problem um, that developing countries often have in order to sell in the sustainability market is to prove that their product is sustainable. 
And that's often costly for them. And that's one of the issues uh, we address by finding out how the different um, processes can be put in place and how this can be done in the least costly, least costly way. And then uh, lowest level from level, what needs the company to be able to do? Often uh, issues of storage are very important in order to um, meet the uh, quantity and quality targets for, uh, for exports. Uh, what do they need to do in order to be able, what kind of quality insurance in order to be able to meet sustainability standards? So we work at these different levels, firm level, ecosystem, business ecosystem, and the national level. And in agriculture, really very important, the whole quality insurance ecosystem that uh, needs to be set up. I will finish by going back from implementation to information, because we use the informa information we have also to understand how we can better implement. And one interesting thing we found out using the data on the sustainability map is that private sector players can play an important development role also in this area. We find that if a standard is set <coughs> by a lead firm, by a private sector, rather than by a government or an NGO, it's more likely that the, pri the lead firm helps to meet the cost of, set of, of uh, implementing the standard. Mm -hmm. So the certification, the moving up uh, your production, the way of producing, it's costly. If this costly investment takes place within a private sector chain, it's often interesting for the producer, for the SME, because the buyers con uh, con um, contribute to paying the price, to meeting the cost. Caveat uh, problem you already need to be a relatively strong supplier in order to be of interest to the lead firm. So if you are at the lowest level micro firm, mm -hmm. often the lead firms will not be interested in producing with you. So you need to have a certain, uh, meet a certain level of production in order to be interesting for the lead firms, and then the lead firm even helps you. So you can get a positive um, a spillover effect, but you need to be, be at a certain level already. So this is an area of work where ITC um, is very active, whether at the applied, uh, at the applied uh, level, uh, but like previous, uh, also like previous speakers, by giving a lot, paying a lot of attention to bringing different stakeholders together. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Uh, a few points from, from your, your, your presentation. Thank you for giving us this value chain analysis of the ITC work methodology from information strategies, implementation, and sustainability uh, being a horizontal theme there. And if I could just pick up again two points from your, your, your presentation, it was, I think it's meshing and, and gelling very well with what the other speakers were saying, and particularly Jane. Uh, you mentioned when developing strategies, the importance of governmental policy objectives that, of course, provide the framework uh, for, the, for the other helping actors to, to come in. And that's where what Jane was saying, that working with the governments for their policies to be conscious of the nexus is important, because if a, if a governmental policy does not put it as an objective, strategy will not follow from that. So that, that, that's a, a, a very true. Also, very usefully, you brought in the and strengthen there further what Jane was saying regarding the role of stakeholders in that context, the role of private sector, which can be a, uh, play a developmental role uh, with the role of the lead firm. Uh, the policy and the strategy may be conscious of the nexus, but if the private sector is not conscious of that or not taking steps towards that, it is not going to be, to be really implemented. So thank you very much for bringing those points. Now we move to the the, the last speaker for this session, uh, uh, David Vivas uh, from Anktar. So, David, and you have a PowerPoint, huh? Okay. A, hello. Hello. I will use a PowerPoint just to show some evidence, but before we start, I would like to first thank... Uh, uh, sorry, I don't know how to use this. Uh, Julia, I don't know. Uh, well, we get the technical issue solved. I would like to thank uh, Cots for the invitation. Uh, I think it's, uh, they have a very special program 
is the only civil society organization working on this nexus of climate change, trade, and food security. Usually climate change and trade are not very good friends in the WTO context. They tend to be very controversial, so they are trying to apply and develop these linkages on practice. Uh, for also, I would like to say that COTS is, uh, for ONTAC, a partner. It's not a civil society organization. We work together, especially in the competition policy area and in the environment area. This is uh, not my presentation. Uh, it will come. Sorry. Well, while it comes, uh, it seems that it's not working. I, 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 I will avoid it, but I wanted to show you some images that will make uh, the argumentation less important. Okay, well, we come. One important factor when we analyze this nexus between climate change, trade, and food security is demographics. Besides climate change, the most important factor of change in the 21st century is going to be demographics. And I'm going to show you how. Just by 2035, we will add 1.4 billion people to the planet. Just to give you what is this, this is another China. And we will have to feed them. Okay? The second element of demographics is that we are getting older. So the population average, the age average, at 235 is going to be 45 years old. So these two factors are going to change how we produce, what we produce, and how we consume. One of the big elements of this change is that we may need more nutritious and less caloric food. Okay? So that's going to be an important change. And this is where I come on my perspective on food security. I will be talking about fish, which is an important natural protein, more than other agricultural produce, production inland, aquaculture can take place inland, so we will go in fish for thought, more than food for thought. So uh, let's look at climate change. Here we have uh, showing evidence on the records of high temperatures on the sea surface. This is from the NOAA. This is not IPCC. This is the American say it, not, not the, these, uh, these uh, radical NGOs. This is the assessment of temperatures during the first semester of 2017, including the three coldest months of the year. And you have record highs in all the fishing areas, Mediterranean, Pacific, Indian Ocean, etc. So an interesting element to take into account, fisheries is not perhaps the sector that generates more emissions, but it consumes about 1.2 to 1.4 percent of all oil and fuel, because it's first being subsidized, and second is we are not fishing with sailing boats anymore. These are fuel-based fishing boats, and many are very old, and they pollute not only in terms of CO2, but also in many other GHG uh, gases that are very toxic. Now, the second slide is with these changes in temperature, the biomass is going to move, and the biomass is going to go down. Okay? The fish need certain levels of temperature to migrate or stay in certain areas. I'll give you the example of tuna, which is very important for international trade. It needs a temperature between 10 to 16 degrees. Goes higher, it goes south or goes north. And most of the tropical tuna is going in the Pacific, from the Philippines, PNU, New Zealand, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, and come back. And when the temperatures start to go up, this is going to go to the Arctic or to the Antarctic. So mostly developing countries and fishing nations in the tropics are going to get affected. According to a recent assessment of the FAO, there may be even a drop of 55% of the biomass because it will affect reproduction and migration patterns by 2055. These are not very good news. No? I don't want to be... Uh, apocalyptic, but I think we need to start facing reality in a different manner. Climate change is becoming a new normality. Who thought Houston was going to be underwater 10 years ago? Okay, you have to, somebody will have to pay the cost. Now, another element that even with the Paris Agreement, and even if we are all very good kids and we comply with all the promises that we will do in their national determined contributions, we are only going to start curbing emissions, if we do well, by 2035. 
and all the carbon that we have generated until 2035 is going to stay there for many years. And we will increase for some time, not increase, but we will continue emitting, hopefully going down over at least 50 more years, hopefully. Now, uh, the global trends in fish stock. This is very well known uh, a chart from the FAO. This is the most recent one. But uh, basically, we are increasing the amount of fishing and we have 90% of the stocks are fully fish or overfish, about 10 to 15% are overfish, and underfish is a very small amount, less than 10%, and this is basically non-commercial species, things that nobody will eat. Okay, so we are, we are really overdoing it. Besides that, we arrived at the year 2000, more or less, at a level of capture of 90 million tons. And we have not increased that level since 2000. We are 2017. What does it mean? That's it. There is no more fish. Okay? And with this fish, we feed approximately 55% of the demand. And this will lead me to another, uh, to another chart, uh, which I will go this and go back here. Uh, aquaculture is almost doing uh, half of, of the supply today, and in the future, aquaculture will be the business. But this is a very different business from fisheries. Aquaculture is closer to cattle rancher than to fishing. And it's a totally different production system. The advantage is we can control it, but there are many externalities and things we will have to deal with. And now, what all these tell us today? Uh, that the players today are very different than the players in the past. Since the year 2010, the curves start to go in different directions developing countries became the biggest players. And this means we will be the responsible countries on the future of stocks. So we cannot hide from it. And these are the numbers. 60% of all export, fish exports come from developing countries. 74% of the capture is done by developing countries. And 95% of the aquaculture. So we need to start taking responsibility and do something about it. We won't be able to blame any colonial power for what is going to happen. Now, link it to reality today here in WTO. When I did this slide, this was before I came, I had four scenarios. Three of them were proved to be much more optimistic than what we got yesterday night. Yesterday night, we got an agreed decision that basically has two elements. One, that we will continue negotiating with a view of finalizing an agreement by 2019, the next ministerial conference, and that we will recommit, member states will recommit, to notify subsidies according to the subsidies agreement as today. I'll translate this in two words, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, that's what we got, very simple. As I show, I was trying to be opti optimistic and all my scenarios were wrong except D, which is no outcome. You have a decision, but there is not real, not, not, nothing in there. Now you have there a, a chart that can be useful for all of you. This is all the components of most of the proposals that have been put on the table. This implies a half an hour more of explanation, but you have it there, and if you want to discuss the elements, we can do in the question part or in an analysis. Now, also, I had an analysis, like I was being optimistic, uh, that there will be advantages of having a fish agreement, but we don't have it. So we are in the disadvantages part, which is we have less time to comply with Sustainable Development Goal 14.6. So we have one more chance. But like we didn't advance on anything, on anything, the risk of failure is very high. Because this is like gambling. You will put all your chips in the next poker game. And if nothing comes, you lose everything. And we will miss the SDG 14, for 14, 6, and this might generate a domino effect because this is an early harvest. This is by 2020. So we will start missing the first SDG that is in the timeline until 2030. And by the way, it's important to recall that SDGs are a mandate by heads of states. And by the way, heads of states are above ministers of trade, right? So we should do our homework. Finally, uh, we need to consider that they continue, will continue to be public incentives for IU fishing, overfishing, and overcapacity. I've been trying to say this, but this is, this is very sad. You know, there is no worse public policy 
you are giving public money, tax payers, payers money, to overfish a, a, a resource that is depleted. Second, you are giving public money for an activity that generates emissions. Third, you are giving money for an activity that destroys livelihoods in many other countries, especially in the small scale and artisanal fisheries business. And finally, this is unfair competition. So if you want to do it bad, you got it all. Okay? And uh, finally, uh, the, the level of depletion will continue because with fuel subsidies, you will continue to fish further, deeper, and for longer. And by the way, all this package, even if we will get this package as a whole, imagine today we got everything that is on the table. Like in the WTO, we have the definition of a specificity in the subsidies agreement related to subsidies. Fuel subsidies are not covered. And so, which is 80% of the problem. So we are hiding the sun with one finger. Uh, so finally, my conclusions, climate change is there. It's a new normality. So we need to start to include it as a factor in all sectoral development plans, whether agriculture, because you have rain-fed problems, whether fisheries, whether manufacturing, whether ports, services, you have to factor it in. If you don't do it, you are in the, in the wrong side, because variability is too high already. Second, we need to do national feedstock assessment and quota settings that consider that, because the quotas are being set only by the biomass, but the biomass may be moving all over. Third, aquaculture seems to be something that will emerge because it's in a controlled environment. There is lower risk with climate change, but there are some elements that may emerge like disease spread. With higher temperatures, disease spread faster, so you might have to use more antibiotics, etc. So perhaps it's not a solution. Um, I have mixed feelings. Uh, we need to face out these harmful subsidies. Let's hope uh, we can do it in the next ministerial. If not, we need to think of alternative methods. One could be going through national assessments, the other be bring a UN treaty. There are many other options that we need to start thinking if WTO members cannot deliver in this, in this process. We need to start shifting in fisheries to uh, low fuel intensive boats and engines and low impact methods such as pool fishing, selective fishing, so we have less level of discard, so we have less impact on the food chain, the food web. And remember, all life on Earth is based on the food web of the oceans. Mm -hmm. Everything starts with plankton. You kill it, we kill ourselves. It's, all is interrelated, I'm sorry. Uh, another message that is not here, but is very important. As a consequence of climate change and demographics, ecosystems will provide each day less services. What I'm saying is, we are affecting the planet to a such extent that we, the nature will produce less for more. So we have to manage. There is no other way. We have to manage. Finally, I think the role of civil society organizations like COT is essential. COT supported the only soft law related to the regulation of fish, of, of fish subsidies in ONTAC 14 conference issued by FAO, UNEP, and ONTAC. We took a big risk, supported by 91 countries. We couldn't go above, but there are 91 countries committed, many international NGOs, many international governmental organizations of regional nature. There are many that won. Perhaps we need to go with those willings. And finally, uh, COTS has done a very important analysis on the impact of fish subsidies on freshwater fishing, especially in the big lakes of Africa, which is very important because these lakes are fed with rain, with whatever is left from glaciers, and if these rivers become slimmer, you will have less level of lakes going down, affecting food security in the middle of Africa. So we have to do something about it. And with that, I leave you. Thank you, Rashid, for the thing. Thank you very much, David, uh, for, as always, a very thoughtful, uh, analytical, and, and well-argued presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, not to in any way, because what you are saying is definitely presents a grave and, 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 and a real picture, this climate change being a new normality. Uh, but if I can just take liberty to, to lighten the mood a bit uh, when you mentioned the demographics. So thank you very much for reminding us that we are getting older, uh, which, is, which is true. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, where 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 uh, uh, David ended is, is a kind of a nice nice continuation from what where Elia started and brought in the issue of the smart trade rules, and then we heard about the nexus approaches and methodology and the role of private sector, and now fisheries come in as a very concrete, potentially very.
promising example where the three areas that we are looking at uh, converge. Trade, uh, the climate change issue, the environmental issue, the food security issue, and then the role that trade can, or the trade rules can play by dealing with the fishery subsidies. Although that does not seem to be happening, but the example is very powerful. And maybe if there is some success in this area, one can use it as an example for future as well. Uh, it's, uh, I'm seeing the board saying we have nine minutes left. By my watch, it should be 20 minutes. So I will go by my watch. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so in this uh, 20 minutes, let me open the floor uh, to hear your views. So please, uh, those who want to take the floor should uh, introduce yourself and then your question and comment as briefly as possible. I will start from here. The gentleman on the second row, the left. Uh, is there any mic? I, I need a microphone. I can hear you, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I ask to the chairman uh, permission to make a question to the audience. May I? Uh, uh, okay, I mean, yes. Small. Yeah, question. But, uh, but I, yeah, no, that should be fine, sir. Yes. I would, but let me also just say that I would not give the right the, to the audience to respond to that immediately. <laughs> okay. But please ask your question. <laughs> Uh, I am a veterinarian, and I want to know in the audience how many of us belong to the health uh, sector, you know, of medicine or veterinarians. Uh, any raise a hand? Nobody. I no. can imagine that. Mm -hmm. I I am surrounded by people related to trade. Uh, I am uh, the vice president of the global network of veterinarians specialized in animal welfare. We are in a small network, but in a key issue. Animal welfare is uh, closely related to the quality of meat, and we are talking about the, health, the food safety. You can uh, have food safety without the control of the veterinary science. And now, veterinary science are working in a next step when we start studying about the safety of the quality of meat, uh, we talk about the veterinary public health. The next step is talking about one health. Why? Because 70% of the illness that uh, make ill and kill people are related to animals. 70%. So the uh, one health concept is one step ahead. But why is important? The next step is the one welfare concept because we are working now in the safety and health of human beings, environment, and animals. Please give a, a, a Google this tag, One Health. And the second tag is One Welfare. In all these lectures, or during three days, I never hear this topic with the importance that we have. So my uh, concern is to pay attention and to pay attention all around the world about this important topic. And with your uh, presentation about the fish market, uh, in, the, in the world, in Europe, and in uh, the big producer or the big researcher about uh, fish uh, trade, in uh, the Norway uh, country, and they have in every uh, ship killing whales, a veterinarian to give to the consumer the safety of the best way to kill whales according to veterinary sign. That is amazing. Only one whale you must kill with animal welfare. But nobody pay attention for towns or towns of 
fishing without paying attention of the quality Sir, of uh, can you kindly uh, uh, complete your because we don't have much time and I would like yes. to hear from so others. So that, that is the, the proposition yes. to think uh, that the uh, problem of animal welfare must be related and taken account to the uh, sustainability of the uh, meat consumed and uh, to be aware that we can avoid this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> Any other uh, comments or questions? I, I have a hand here, yes. Thank you. <coughs> I have two comments, sorry, two questions. I'm Bipul Chatterjee from Kurtz International. One for David and the other for Marion. David, uh, being a fish lover, I'm scared of uh, what you have, uh, you have presented. And uh, my question may be silly or maybe very Nice. And I'm sh not sure after hearing all these things, the things which are happening in Hilton at the ministerial, whether we are seeing uh, friends of fish or friends of fish subsidies, fisheries subsidies, particularly illegal subsidies or harmful subsidies. So why do you think, I mean, things are so clear, I mean, that not just that we are living in a dangerous world, as far as this issue is concerned. But also, the future is bleak. Why do you think that our ministers are, ministers are unable to see this? I mean, why are they not being able to mm -hmm. come to a satisfactory conclusion of the mm -hmm. discussions which have been taking place for so many years? And we have, as you said, heads of state uh, pledge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and commitment to address this subject. My second question is to Marion, is that I think ITC is doing a great job on all these initiatives which you have talked about, cardamom in Nepal or dairy products in Nepal and things like that. Do you have a platform where you are sharing best practices? Because if you have certain initiatives in Nepal, say, or in Uganda or in Kenya or any other country on a particular product, it is not that that product is being produced only in that country. That product is being produced in other countries also, similar kind of setup, similar type of people who are producing. So if you can have a platform, which is a public good, information sharing of best practices, not just the content of what you have done, but also the process, how you have done it. So then I think it will be possible to upscale the impact of the various initiatives that you are having. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Oh, yeah, so the final question, because then we will hear, we should have a little time for the panelists to respond. Um, well, thanks for, for the flow of information. That was uh, very interesting. It's not that much a question. It's more um, a yes. reflection or a suggestion. Uh, David, in your very alarming uh, intervention, uh, you mentioned two important things which are, in my view, um, quite optimistic. The first one is that it's possible, actually, to reach uh, agreement at the multilateral level. When we look at uh, the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that's the first example, and then the, the Paris Agreement on the climate change is a, a second one. Um, when talking about linkages, uh, my suggestion would be why not opening up the 2019 ministerial conference um, to um, other ministers. And here I mean not only including trade ministers. We have seen that it's very difficult to reach an agreement between uh, trade ministers. But also next to the trade ministers, try to include uh, ministers of people in charge of environment people in charge of development, and so on and so forth. And possibly it will have a more positive impact on the final result of, of uh, the ministerial conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that's quite an interesting that's observation and suggestion. So I will now turn to the, to the panelist and in the reverse order. So we, we, I will start with David, oh, okay. Okay. then Mario. There were a specific question, 
And then I will turn to Jane also because the questions and proposals being mentioned, uh, I'm sure you would have reflections on that as well, uh, like the, the suggestion made by the last intervention, as well as on fisheries as well, so, so kindly. So then Jane, and then finally, Elia, you will have the final word. David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijul, for, for the questions. Uh, there are three reasons, and each reason is linked to one country. I will mention the countries, but this is how the world works. The first reason is linkages with the single undertaking and the Doha round. Not one single solution, but comprehensive package, number one. Number two, lack of engagement at the multilateral level, meaning we don't care. Number three, it will be that there are very strong vested interests in the fishing fleets in main fishing nations. And one of the problems of subsidies is that generate a rate rent-seeking behavior in whoever is receiving. I, I'm going to give a phrase. My father used to be a politician in my country. He said, the only problem with subsidies is if I'm getting them or not. If I get them, I love them. If my friend gets them, I don't like them. You see? So there are many industries, fleets, that receive these subsidies <coughs> that would like to continue receiving them and have a strong lobbying capacity in many nations. Okay? Those are the three main reasons. Uh, on the point of multilateralism from the gentleman, I agree there is some hope, but we need to understand that multilateralism in the WTO is different than in the UN. In the UN, you can have treaties with 90 countries, 50 countries plus. In the WTO, it's full consensus, meaning everybody agrees on something, and it's becoming less and less likely. It's becoming very difficult. And second, I think, uh, perhaps this is a personal take on the matter, I think we still have not developed a way of dialogue and communication among the new power relations. In the Uruguay round, the power relation was the Quad, mostly from the north. But now you have some players that are not as small, China and India, and they together have more than half of the world market. So if there is not a way that these powers, this is a new power relation, you may like it, not may like it, don't find a way to, to agree, it's very difficult that anybody else agrees. And usually when there is an impasse, it's because the most powerful nations don't agree. Usually the others will help to influence, but that's what is happening. Uh, so my point is that, that, again, there are opportunities for multilateralism, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to reach agreement. And also, a point on, on, on the point of delegations. It is possible today that any country brings not only the Minister of Trade, but they can bring the Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery. It happens. It happens. They also bring parliamentarians. This is happening. What I'm starting to feel is that negotiators, especially the ones in Geneva on the day-to-day -day basis, are not being empowered to take decisions. They are being empowered to say no, but they are not being empowered to say yes. Thank you, David. Marion? Um, yeah, I may uh, maybe like to start to uh, come back to this uh, the issue of animal uh, well, uh, welfare. Um, it is actually an issue that uh, has played an important role in the WTO, and it's, it does play a role in the type of work we, we do. Um, an agreement like the SPS agreement exists because of the use of hormones in beef. Now you. It may have been treated mainly as a health issue, a human health issue, than an animal welfare issue, but uh, there's a long, decade long history of um, members not considering the existing treaty appropriate. A TBT agreement was created from this, and from there the SPS agreement. So this issue has been important. Uh, fishing practices have been uh, the object of a number of uh, prominent disputes at the WTO2. And uh, when we work on standard setting or labeling, uh, this is also often related to animal, uh, animal welfare. Um, so um, this, uh, I talked about these things generally, but this topic is of importance and has been of importance for uh, the trade community. The um, issue of the, of the best practices, the, most of the strategies we do are available on our website. Um, and they are available if the national stakeholders agree to this. Sometimes they want to keep things to themselves, uh, but uh, so there you will be able to see and also to compare across countries how we have approached sometimes similar sector in, uh, in different contexts and what came out of, uh, of that. 
when it comes to best practices in general, um, we will bring out actually this after afternoon a guide that we call the SME Guide to Value Chains. Um, it's not sector specific, this guide, so it just doesn't just focus on agriculture, but it is a general guide helping SMEs to think about being uh, competitive, how to approach um, producing for a larger market, and how to approach dealing with uh, bigger firms within a value chain. So that's uh, that's definitely a guide uh, that brings together best uh, best practices from the company's point of view as a producer within within the value chain. Um, last but not uh, least, I have forgotten my point. Now, uh, yes, I wanted to come back to this point of the sustainability map. Um, I found that I have mixed feelings when I see this willingness to act and collaborate among private sector players compared to the lack of moving into these directions among governments. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's encouraging because at least there will be some progress. It's, um, it, it's, some, it's a bit of a concern because the private sector is profit-seeking and will uh, seek a, diff a diff certain type of interest, which is not necessarily uh, taking into account consumers and human health in the way we would like it to be. So I would like a, or to see a bit more of that also at the governmental level, but indeed so far yeah. not much progress has been made. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Jen? Um, I, I will just make a comment on the issue of bringing together um, ministers from development and maybe environment uh, in these negotiations. Uh, that would be an ideal situation. But given the complications, maybe it might not be diff um, easy. But maybe what needs to be done, what can be done, is for countries to be able to harmonize their positions at, at national level. So that by the time the negotiators come, the trade negotiators are in <clears throat> Geneva, they can be able to have that holistic approach to, uh, to their positions. But it would be the ideal, really, because you can't, development is indivisible. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. Elia? Uh, thank you, Rashid. Um, uh, again, I think uh, Jane has said uh, very well on the, uh, the question of whether we could include other ministers to come and also join the discussion. But from the legal um, uh, aspect of the negotiations in the WTO, again, the Minister of Trade is the one who is uh, the responsible one and to ensure implementation remain uh, legal and binding. Um, also, why discussion to, on fisheries to happen in the WTO, but also is, of course, fish, um, the subsidies. Uh, there is a trade aspect of it, yeah. but also um, there is also the enforcement mechanism which is well established in the WTO, and we want also to capitalize on that, yeah. especially on the issue of the using the DSU, the dispute settlement body, so that in on coming of the enforcement, it's going to be more uh, of enforcement, uh, of uh, more legal, as compared to other UN uh, organization where it is just a wish and uh, an intention of the ministers or intention of the heads of state to implement, but uh, there is no <coughs> binding legality on, on how they can implement. So WTO remains to be one of the most important avenue to discuss this because you will make sure that implementation is uh, uh, for, I mean, uh, legally foreseeable. Uh, if you come to the point has raised on the, are there fisheries friends or fisheries subsidies friends? This is the question also we have been asking ourselves in the discussion, uh, especially also even to uh, the developed members. They should also show the leadership in this perspective because they, they have been fishing, and I can say in their times they have been fishing more responsibly as compared to the coming giant developing members who are fishing in a way which is more destructive than they used, I mean, the developed country used to be. So developed countries also, they have to demonstrate the um, the willingness to take commitments and real commitments. And these discussions, when we started, we were asking members that can we begin by identifying who, who, uh, which countries are, subs are subsidizing their fishermen, how much. If you begin to know that 
China is subsidizing 100 billion US dollar. If you know it is 1 trillion dollar, then you can uh, even be able to cap, to say, okay, at least let's cap the amount of money going to the fishery uh, sector, uh, especially in, on, on, on fishing. But again, can we identify there are types of uh, subsidies which are good. For example, if they are related to researches and uh, technologies involved in the fishing, then we could promote them instead of all capping together as uh, a bad subsidies. Mm -hmm. So uh, to my view is that uh, we still have a work to do and we will continue the discussion in the WTO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elia. Uh, in the remaining few seconds, let me thank you, uh, and uh, I will uh, thank the panelists also in a second. And if I could try to conclude here very briefly, and let's say perhaps on a positive note, that uh, as Jane said, development is indivisible. And if this message uh, takes hold uh, across uh, policy strategies and actors, then we can move forward. Uh, uh, then in that uh, context, the uh, example given by Marion that in the private sector, this greater tendency to collaborate, maybe that is a lesson that the governments can and should learn. And finally on fisheries, and both David and Elia said that maybe we remain still hopeful in the sense that those who are friends of fisheries subsidies are outnumbered by the friends of fish. So maybe on that positive note, and with great thanks to my panelists, uh, and let's give them a hand of applause as well. Thank you.